welcome to Bike World. Here's what's coming up on this show. Find out how much body protection and armour has come on in the last 30 years as we pay a visit to the company that pioneered it. Plus we'll take a closer look at the full range of KTM Learner Legal Bikes. But first, in the last series, we were following Austin Vince in his quest to conquer the Sahara. Huh? So we've come down to PH Motorcycles Adventure Day here in Crawley, which is a special day they've organised for a few customers to test out some alternative and some of the latest adventure bikes on the market. And we thought it would be a great way to put our new camera bike, the Triumph Explorer, through its paces. But not just for that reason, because we're also here to catch up with our man Austin Vince, just back from Mondo Sahara, travelling just thousands of miles throughout the desert, and a proper adventure biker, I'd say. Well, uh, that's, you're very kind, Luke. <laughs> but yeah, we, uh, it's a great thrill to be here and to be uh, able to get uh, a look at what the latest kind of adventure bikes are. So it's a new world for me. I'm not, uh, I'm not from the kind of high-speed, expensive, brand-new, massive motorcycle thing. I'm used to a more manageable, smaller bike. So I'm very keen to see uh, what the industry is telling us we should be riding. Now, I'm guessing your bike would have massive advantages in the off-road um, scenarios, being lighter and being a proper off-road bike. But of course, most people who buy these bikes do a lot of commuting on the road. So how is your bike going to fare against that? It's going to be interesting to see. Well, um, uh, the, uh, the DR350 that I've got is, I live in West London, mm -hmm. and uh, around town, a bike like that is king. However, when you get onto a, what you might call a good British A road, twisty biker's road, You'll find that the DR350 is king, ah. and uh, because it's only on the long motorway stretches where, of course, it's lacking, where it just hasn't got the oomph to keep up. You know, you can't cruise at 80 yeah. on a 350. Well, so that, that's where it's uh, that's where it's lacking. And so we'll see we'll see today if uh, if I'm at the back of the pack or if it's tortoise and hare. I think this could be very interesting. We've got 150 brake horsepower multi stride, the new KTM 1190 Adventure. We'll be hoping our cameraman can keep up on the Explorer because he's gonna have a job to do. So should we go out there and ride some bikes? Let's go. day done we've stopped off for a bit of lunch here at the pub and we've just waved goodbye to the rest of the gang so me and Austin can have a bit of a catch-up because Austin last time we saw you you were just preparing and it was literally 24 hours before you left to head out on Mondo Sahara your latest adventure um how did it go uh it, it was you're still here that's the important yeah thing. yeah yeah we, we all survived and everything uh, it was uh, a spectacular success in that given that we've just a load of ordinary guys uh we've got proper full-time jobs we're trying to hold down we had a, a dream to do this ambitious trip into the Sahara, and and we, we did some planning, and 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 it, and it worked. That was great. We had a couple of injuries. Uh, my bike uh, broke down, but the um, but we were, we were managed to repair it in the field. It was um, it was only a four week trip. Yeah. The whole uh, emphasis, the whole the credo of Mono Sahara was I wanted to demonstrate what an exciting, uh, an elaborate, and uh, an exhilarating trip one could. Uh, achieve in just four weeks. So let me get this right again and recap this because there were seven of you on Honda XR400s and you had a bit of a unique way of restocking at night didn't you in the desert? Well the idea was that the first half of the trip, the first two weeks, uh, we made our way off-road as much as we could across Spain, Morocco and Western Sahara until we entered uh, Mauritania, a little town there called Nouadhibou. There we hooked up with a guy called Richard Kempley from a company called Beast of Burden. He'd been out there for the three weeks before we'd arrived doing a kind of thousand mile arc into the desert in his Land Rover, burying food, fuel and water about every um, 80 miles, 80 to 100 miles. And uh, so we met him, he'd completed that, uh, that journey. He'd left a breadcrumb trail on his GPS track log. He gave it to us, not me, I'm an idiot, but the, uh, Paul Castle, the IT guy, he gave it to him. Uh, he did all the wizardry with the GPS and the Apple Mac and all that stuff. And then off we went and, and we literally just followed, we kept going, it was total Pirates of the Caribbean, just kept going across the sand until we got to X marks the spot. Well, I think it's a big thing, uh, having known you for a while now, Austin, and, and talking about the, the Adventure Mondo Sahara, is that for you, adventure motorcycling is not getting on a bike and riding on the trodden path or even roads or motorways. It is literally putting yourself in a situation where you don't know what's going to happen, isn't it? It is proper adventuring, uh, is the true meaning of the word almost. 
Well, Luke, I'm not sure if I can add to that. You've summed it up perfectly. I would suggest that when Chris Scott coined the phrase adventure motorcycling, what he meant was motorcycling in a country, but more accurately, a continent that you're not used to. Yeah. Uh, where you don't know what's going to happen. And I don't mean like, I don't know what's going to happen in an hour. You know, I might be at some traffic lights. Or yeah. I might be at McDonald's, but you know, you know what I mean. But we can, if we run out of fuel, we'll be able to walk to a petrol station. Yeah. We know there's going to be a pub or a restaurant somewhere to get, or a shop to get food yeah. because we're in civilized, Sorry. <laughs> Adventure motorcycling means that you're outside of your comfort zone. Yeah. And that means that not only do you not know what's going to happen, but more accurately, if something bad happens, then you're probably going to have to do something unusual to solve whatever the bad thing is, yeah. whatever the problem is. And that's therefore why I would suggest, with no unkindness intended, that uh, you, adventure motorcycling does, can't really take place in first world countries. You don't just do it yourself. You curate a film festival, don't you, where you bring together some of the best films from around the world about adventuring, don't you? Adventuring. Like yeah, yeah. It's, uh, my wife and I, um, Lois Price and I, won, uh, run... Who herself is a travel writer, isn't it? Oh, totally. She's uh, the, she's the yeah. female motorcycle travel writer, yeah. I would say. You know, I mean, she's, got an, she's got an excerpt of her, of her most recent book, Red Tape and White Knuckles. That's in the New York Times this week as we speak. That's pretty, that's pretty you good. You know, I mean, who else, is, who else is getting that? For somebody who, is, who hasn't got celebrity cachet, yeah. it's, it's through the sheer quality of the writing and the quality of the adventure. One woman on her own on a 250 riding from London to Cape Town, across the Sahara, then West Coast through Angola, yeah, Congo, all that stuff. Incredible, isn't it? You know, celebrities don't go there. Yeah. You know what I'm Saying. I can see why you two are together. <laughs> but, but you do, you, well, this festival comes up, it's in August, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so it's it's a, uh, it's like a rock festival type thing, same kind of format, but instead of it being bands mm -hmm. that you see, you're watching adventure travel films. So all this is going on, Mondo uh, Sahara will be coming out, I believe, will it not as a film? Now, I know there's gonna be a premiere in London in October. Afraid so? Which, uh, I may say afraid so, because most people watching this won't be allowed to come to it. Yes, I'll be trying <laughs> to blag myself into that one. Uh, but uh, but the, yeah, the DVD, yeah. the. The Mondo Sahara DVD will be out um, in autumn, and it's, uh, it's sure, I mean, the idea is that it's the most inspirational film I've ever made. I want people to go adventure yeah. motorcycling, uh, and, it, and they don't have to buy an adventure bike yeah. for that, or they don't have to buy a bike with the, with the word adventure in it. Yes. But my mission is to get every normal person to go off and do something, you know, really unusual with some mates not on an, an organised tour. And as and, you say, you, know, you don't need one of these bikes behind us, but we must point out, these have been a lot of fun today, and I think you're, we've had some fun with your uh, DR350 as well. You even, we even got you at one point onto one of the bigger bikes. But I'm a little bit worried because it's starting to rain. We should probably get going again. The adventure begins. The adventure begins right now. It isn't really adventuring in, in the, the truest term of the word. We're just going to head down the A272 for a bit, maybe turn a left at the roundabout, and then uh, head back to the PH motorcycle. But for me, it's an adventure. We'll have fun anyway. Said that they're gone. The seven strong machine made it south to the sun. It was a pretty successful disaster. So scream if you want to go faster. Mondo Sahara. Well, if you want to join Austin for a few days of fun, then just head to adventuretravelfilmfestival.com for more information. Now, you're probably wondering what we're doing here in such posh surroundings. Well, it's Whittlebury Park near Silverstone Race Circuit, and the reason we are here is this, the brand new KTM Duke 390. Now, they've invited us down here to have a play on it today, and this is a bike that's designed for people with a new A2 license in mind. But while we were here, we thought we should cast an eye over their full range of learn legal bikes. So Susie, when KTM brought out the Duke 125 back in 2011, it took the small capacity or learner bike market, as we like to call it, by storm. And it's now the best selling 125 sports bike in Europe. And I think you can see why, can't you? It's definitely the meanest looking 125 on the road, isn't it? And I, I think, imagine turning up at college or university, your late teens, early 20s, on that. When you're trying to get people into biking, it's to appeal to their slightly childhood side. You want something to be cool, you want it to be aggressive, you want it to be colourful. And I mean, look at it with the coated trellis frame through to the actual proper parts of it, WP suspension, Brembo or Bay Bray as they're known, brakes. 
it's a proper bike. It doesn't feel like a 125. No, it really, really doesn't. Only the size of the bike makes you think that you're riding a bigger bike. And that, I think, is a really important thing to mention today. The 125, 200 and 390 all have the same chassis and frame. And the bikes are literally all the same size, same switch gears. There's not a discernible difference apart from the engine. And as you say, you get on the 125, it feels like a big bike. And as a young rider, that's something you really want. Not only to give you the feel as you go on to bigger bikes and bigger machines, to have that confidence, but also so you don't feel like you're on a little kind of pizza bike getting blown around by the wind and bullied by traffic. But the thing is, is that they look really bulky. They look like they're going to be heavy, but when you ride them, they're really light and agile. But it's not just the fact that they're light. I mean, each bike is powered by a single cylinder engine, which is really refined, but blimey, it produces quite a lot of power. In the 125, you've got 14 brake horsepower, and the 200 is 27, and in the 390, a whopping 44 brake horsepower, which when you consider the bikes are 150 kilo wet, that's not bad. But to be able to ride the 390 on an A2 license, you have to have it restricted by one and a half brake horsepower. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, but the dealers indeed. will do that for you for free. There was a massive difference, wasn't there, between power of the 125 and the 390, I found so anyway. No, I think you're completely right. I mean, on paper, it is a 30 brake horsepower difference, but it's also the way it delivers it. I'm really impressed with the 125 low down. It's got loads of torque and loads of grunt, but it ran out of steam with Fatal Wilkins on the back at about 60 miles an hour, where on the 200 and 390, you just seem to have a little bit more oomph. On the 200, it was running out about 70, 75, and the 390, obviously, a little bit more. I wouldn't know, because doing those speeds on English roads would be illegal. They don't just go well, they stop well too. And the 125 is the first 125 to have ABS. Yeah, completely. In fact, they were real pioneers bringing that in. And when you're learning what better technology would you want on your bike, then it's going to allow you, I mean, I don't know about you, my first accident at home in 125 was grabbing the front brake too hard, following a car too closely and I came off. You don't know how powerful the brakes are. From a personal point of view, I love riding KTMs off-road and they do so well in the motocross, enduro market, um, green laning, people love KTMs off-road. But on the road, this is the first time that I've ridden a KTM, but they really are coming into their own now, aren't they? KTM have literally identified the road sports bike market and specifically the small capacity bike market as one they really want to dominate. In fact, they can see their market almost quadrupling in this area in the next five years. They want to be the number one sports bike maker by 2017, which is a mighty claim indeed. So I think in the next few years, we will be able to see some other radical models, maybe a sports 125, maybe a sports bike RC390, who knows? But yeah, they are taking this sector of the market very seriously. And I think you can see that when you look at the three Dukes we've been riding today because it's the attention to detail. So price-wise, Luke, the 125, 3995, the 200, 4195, and then the 390, 4495. But do you know which one I'm going to pick as my favourite? Uh, I'm going to guess, the 125? Yes, it is going to be the 125. <laughs> and do you know why? I imagine because it's going to get so many people into biking. It's exactly that. It is... To me, what biking is all about, when you're young, you want something colourful, vibrant, independent, fun, and just great to ride. And I don't know this anymore, but I've been told it's pretty cool. It's got bags of personality, hasn't really it? It really has. But for £500 more, you can get the 390, and when you've got the full bike licence, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You'd you go really for the 390. like that, don't you? Yeah, I really liked it. So in other words, we like the 125, we like the 390, we actually like the 200, but don't really see it fitting in the UK. I think what we're trying to say is actually, if you're a learner, legal rider, or if you're looking at getting into biking, you've got so many nice, cool and exciting options that you probably didn't have a few years ago. And guys, that is a major turn on, that 125. Turning up, turning up at uni in that, on that. Amazing. No biker likes to fall off or have an accident, but unfortunately the possibility is always there. And no matter how good a rider you are, there's always some other numpty on the road. True, but the good thing is in the last 30 years, advancements in body arm and protection have meant that having such an accident needn't be the disaster that it once was. So to find out more, we thought we'd head about as far north as you can go in this country without having to don a tartan dress to a town called Cockermouth <coughs> to find out about the company that pioneered it all. You know that place well, don't you? <coughs> And so I'm here with Jeff Travell, the founder of Knox. And Jeff, you actually invented the first ever back protector, didn't you? Yeah, I did, yeah, a long, a long time ago, way back in the early 80s. I was an upholsterer, and, and upholstery paid for my racing. Uh, and I got to know Barry Sheen quite well, and I, and I was told by one of his managers that he used 
a foam cushion from his mum's sofa in the back of his leathers. Barry Sheen, legend. Barry Sheen, legend, yeah. I'm an upholsterer and the penny dropped. Well, why can't I make a back protector? And three months later, the first back protector ever produced came out in December 81. In, in 82, we went to the British GP at Silverstone and the Rosses and Lorenzo of the day uh, were queuing outside our van buying, buying this product from us. And, and we go through the years. I mean, today, this is the Aegis. This is our most popular back protector. It's our best seller by a country mile. Look how much it's come on from that original piece of mold. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a really flexible uh, back protector. But you don't have to go for the full-on back protection like this because you're actually quite subtly wearing a, a, a new range from you guys, aren't you, of protection right now? Well, yeah. this, this is and, just a foam jacket. This, this is just a normal, just a normal everyday jacket. <laughs> Underneath, I have our new Urban shirt. And that the whole concept of that is to show it's very low profile, low key, but really great level of protection. Well, this has still got, as you say, prop up modern protection in there, and yet you can just wear that over a shirt. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know we're going to do a little bit of a demonstration later to show the different standards of armour and what it's like to have armour on and not have armour on in a crash. But first up, it's not just armour you do as well, is it? Let's go take a look at some of your gloves. Brilliant. This obviously is the, is the famous hand droid. Uh, and the, the big difference with this unique feature is the, is the exoskeleton finger protectors, which are there designed to protect these knuckles. Uh, it then links into a metacarpal protector that protects at the back of the hand and all the bones in there and the knuckles there. Uh, then we turn it over and you've got the scaphoid protection system. And the great thing about that is, as you know, everybody puts their hand out. It's a natural human reaction. But with the scaphoid, uh, and particularly on a motorcycle, you've got speed involved. And as soon as you've got speed involved, typically uh, the normal leather of a glove has a high coefficient of friction, similar to a road. It's yeah. very, very grippy, wears out very fast. So if you go down without that, the hand grips, your body is travelling faster than your hand, so you get hyperextension. Oh. And if you don't get hyperextension, you get compression loading. And if it doesn't break your scaphoid, it'll pop your collarbone because the energy has to go somewhere. Something that really intrigues me, Jeff, is the fact that you make a lot of this stuff here, don't you, in your factory? Absolutely, yeah. Would it be cool to go and have a look around and For see sure, how it's done? For sure, absolutely no problem. Cool. So we're now on the factory floor where all the magic happens. And Jeff, this is literally the door where all the raw materials for the armour come through, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. The material, all the raw materials come in here. They'll either go into a safe storage, or they'll go just straight down to be cut. So, Jeff, uh, as you can see, these are all the raw materials. Now, for what you're currently uh, making on the line now, you've got three different types of material, haven't you? That you're using. Yeah, absolutely. We've got we've got the honeycomb section here, which is the, the protective element, and then we've got two different thicknesses of foam. So it's really interesting. As you can see on the wall there, it's all the different templates for all the different shape of armour that you absolutely, make. Absolutely, yeah. There's just tons and tons and tons. What's the next stage? Next stage is, is the thermoforming, which is just over here. So, Jeff, what we can see here are the three individual pieces we've just had cut by Dave, and yep. uh, then it looks like they're being put together in almost like making a sandwich. Martin is just literally laying them up, uh, putting the, the honeycomb section uh, onto the soft foam there, ready to go into the oven. So they actually get cooked? Then they get cooked. He's putting one in the oven now and taking one out, swapping them around. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, very finely timed system. So Jeff, this is actually starting to resemble what looks like a back protector, but there's one more stage, isn't there? Yeah, absolutely. After the thermoforming, this has got an excess on that we need to trim off. So the final product comes over here, uh, and Annie's here trimming these. They tr get trimmed straight off here and get straight packed in two boxes that then get ready to be sent out. So Jeff, we're now at the start of the clothing line, aren't we? Yep. And um, that looks very cool. That's a very shiny, nice, sexy mould. What exactly goes on here? Well, th this is an embossing mould. Uh, people don't really realise, associate the complexity of the mouldings when they see the finished product. Yeah. For example, that's uh, part of the finished product that, that actually gets stitched to the back of a gorilla shirt. But when you see that, you don't realise that it's made out of a tool like that. Brilliant. So that's how you get, as you say, the actual moulding there, and yeah. then it needs a bit of sewing, doesn't it? It does, and that goes on to the, the, into this next section. So, Jeff, what's Evelyn doing here? She seems to be laying out lots of material on top of each other. Yeah, basically, when we when we uh, cut garments, we don't cut them individually. We cut them at, at uh, twenty at a time, and Evelyn is now laying up twenty layers of this fabric. She'll mark it then, 
and then cut all of the fabric all at one time. Uh, when all the parts come together, they're put into a box like this with all the labels, all the elastics, all the zips, everything that the machinist needs. So when they get the box, all they have to do is stitch. So Jeff, now we've seen how all the body armour and clothing is made, um, I know a lot of people out there will be saying, well, why should I even bother forking out on body armour? I've just worn a jacket all my life and it's absolutely fine. But you're going to give us a bit of a visual demonstration on the exact difference it can make in an impact, aren't you? Absolutely. Well, I hope so anyway. You know, I think it's very, very convincing. But OK, we've got a bit of foam here that just to purely represent a bit of skin. Excellent. All we do is put a bit of foam on the ground there, drop that five kilo weight on it. Right, so first thing is it's going to be loud yep. and it's going to make a hole. Go so, on. okay. That was loud actually. <laughs> that was loud, see? Let's you, have a look at the damage. You've got, you've got to remember that noise because it's really important. There's the noise. Wow. That, now, and if that was my everybody skin. Everybody will know that if they're, if they're just running down the street and fall over, you can easily put tear of skin in your. Yeah. Uh, tear a hole in your skin. And that's, that's not taking into account friction or anything, is absolutely. it? Absolutely. Now that probably is a bone breaker, there's no question. Now, let's do it with other the bit of skin. Put a new piece in. I'm glad you didn't actually do that on my arm. <laughs> Put the protector over the top and again, listen to the noise. Wow. I mean, that's incredible, isn't it? And that is the Mark. no hole. So this is basically a replica of, of the type of machine that our test house has. Okay. And we're, again, we're dropping five kilos from one meter. And the impact energy of, of that is, is uh, 50 kilonewtons. Yep. And to pass the CE regulations, you have to be below 35 kilonewtons. Is that the amount of energy that's transferred through the panel? That's the amount of energy that's transferred. So to pass the CE test, all you have to absorb is 30%. Again, audio the noise, there's no noise, it's, it's incredible. Staggering. And let's have a look at the graph. 8.57 kilonewtons. And we only need 35 to pass, but, but our best armour is now at 8. So a massive thank you to Knox today for having us up. And it is incredible to know how much body protection has come on in the last 30 years. And well, after what we've learned today, I know what I'm going to be wearing. So that's it for our first episode of Series 4. We'll be back with Episode 2 on June the 13th at 9pm right here on Motors TV. In the meantime, if you'd like to find out about some free rider training that we're offering with ART, then just head to our Facebook page. Luke, you can even bring your mum. And also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And in the meantime, if you want to catch any of our previous episodes of our first free series, you can exclusively download them now on iTunes. Mm -hmm.